everybody to um, this thesis talk and um, wanted to thank you all for being here. Um, our um, usual master of ceremonies, Dustin Mulvaney, could not be here today because he and his wife are having a baby. Oh, Yay. Yeah. So, <laughs> the maternity ward or wherever the babies are born. <laughs> Um, I wanted to welcome you here today um, for the thesis defense by Michelle Delacall, who has done a really excellent job um, conducting research on um, how climate change is affecting um, species in very important local ecological communities, um, in particular the oaks in our area. And so, of course, um, <clears throat> researching and understanding climate change uh, predicting what will happen is is incredibly important um, as we face our climate change world. And um, Michelle did a wonderful job of um, conducting research to try um, using elevation as a proxy for climate change. She'll tell you all about that. She came to us from uh, her undergraduate degree, which she received in Australia, um, doing um, in the bachelor's was in um, environmental resource management. Um, she's kind of a citizen of the world and uh, did work in um, a, a, a numerous places. Uh, finally came to us um, in, we think, fall of 2017. I know for sure she has ripped through this program. <laughs> when she got that idea, she ran with it. And like I guess say, she's done a wonderful job. And I want to thank her other um, committee members, um, Dr. Kristen Bird, who is here from USGS, and Dr. Kate Davis from our department. Um, so please get some snacks and stuff. And uh, so let me turn it over to Michelle. Welcome. Thank you so much, Lynn. So good afternoon. Um, again, my name is Michelle DeMogel. Um, I'd like to welcome you, welcome you to my thesis defense. And uh, today my thesis, well, my thesis is entitled Climate Driven Insect Herbivory in mixed coast live oak woodlands within the Mount Hamilton Range, Santa Clara County. Before I start, I again want to thank my thesis committee, and I also want to share a little bit about why I chose this topic. I was, when I um, was searching for topics, I was very adamant about um, picking something that the Santa Clara uh, County open space, uh, open space managers or vegetation biologists were, uh, were, would, be, would find important. I also wanted to choose an issue that was both biologically and culturally valuable to residents and to people who love the area. So the topic search led me to uh, Coast Live Oaks and also the Biodiverse Mount Hamilton Range. As a quick overview today, I will walk you through the ecological concepts, the theoretical frameworks of my thesis, and then I will also um, guide you through my research methods, the subsequent results, and also the implications of my research, and also the recommendations that I, um, I, I got from this research and what I would recommend to open space managers or people who manage oak woodlands. So within my introduction, I will go through um, multiple ecological concepts and those that are quite uh, pertinent to oak woodlands in Santa Clara County. I'll also present uh, the study gaps and which study gaps I tackled within my thesis. So when we say the association of, of between multi-trophic responses and climate variability, what I'm referring to is the ecological concept of trophic levels and multi-trophic and the relationship between multiple trophic levels. We need to, to understand the mechanisms be behind those multiple trophic levels in order to understand the climate impacts in an ecological zone, in an ecological area. We also need to understand that vegetation and insects are the um, foundation of this complex web of multiple trophic levels. Now when I say uh, trophic levels, these are groups of organisms within an ecosystem that are, have primary, or that have consumption levels that are separate. So let's say apex predators, herbivores, and um, fungi, they are all in separate uh, 
consumption, they all have separate com consumption patterns, and they all lie in different trophic levels. Now, what I'm, my thesis was most concerned about was the, the interaction between the vegetation and um, the insect herbivore, or more specifically, the host plant and uh, the, the insect that may attack or feed on the um, host plant. So, at this foundation, I said it was the vegetation and insects, and to properly manage those multiple trophic levels above the vegetation and insects, we need to understand what's going on there. The, within those communities, they have multi-trophic responses, and those responses are strongly influenced by regional climate, by um, seasonal, seasonal temperature, as well as precipitation trends. And despite increasing evidence of um, observed trends, such as heightened herbivory, insect herbivory, heightened defoliation, <coughs> and, um, as well as uh, increased vegetation mortalities due to um, climate, we still don't understand the finer mechanisms at an organismal level, at a population level, and at a community level. We really need to understand that so that we can create the conditions as managers, as people surrounding the um, oak woodlands, in order to prevent further trends um, of uh, vegetation mortalities, herbivore um, um, outbreaks, or herbivore upsurges. So in particular, we also lack the explanation of how plants medi mediate the responses of um, how plants mediate the responses of herbivores in the context of climate change, and vice versa. We don't under don't fully understand how plants respond to climate change and how herbivores um, mediate that. So that's a very um, uh, important link that we are still exploring um, in this field. For instance, within the climate scenario of unseasonal warming and dry conditions. We would observe the heightened insect delivery, but we don't know exactly why um, the, there is uh, an increase of insects at certain times. So yes, there are study gaps, and yes, we do need plant herbivore studies, but what exactly, how will that exactly um, affect uh, Santa Clara County and, and also the oak woodlands within Santa Clara County? Well, if we, we already have forecasts of, um, of unseasonable uh, temperature spikes, rainfall, as, as well as variable uh, climactic variability. And this is predicted to increase herbivore pressure and uh, coastline oak de defoliation. So if we have that forecast, we still need to understand uh, the finer me mechanisms in order to assess what to prevent in those conditions. So, Knowing that, what were, what have been the past? What are what were the past frameworks used to to understand uh, plant or before studies? Well, there were multiple expl explanatory hypotheses that were used. Um, there's an optimal defense um, uh, hypothesis that was used, as well as other elevational fr frameworks. So the reason why elevation elevational frameworks have been used is because uh, elevation can act as a proxy. It can act as uh, a, an environment that mirrors climate conditions. The difference between temperature as well as uh, weather and other different uh, other conditions at each elevation can actually mimic a cl climate change scenarios for multiple communities. So uh, different researchers use that phenomenon in order to understand what may happen uh, to environments at those, with those uh, various conditions. So other, um, other explanatory hypotheses that have been used in past herbivore studies include resource availability hypothesis and plant size apparent, apparency hypothesis. Now RAH, or the top one, uh, uses uh, the influence or studies the influence of elevation, temperature, as well as precipitation uh, as the, the main driver of insect herbivory and, veg uh, and the relationship to vegetation. Uh, plant size apparency hypothesis, on the other hand, uses size as the main driver for um, the variability in, in uh, plant development, variability in insect development as well. So these two hypotheses have been used in past plant herbivore studies, but not in uh, the Santa Clara County um, area. And we still are 
they still are, the existing ones and the past ones are still inconclusive. So there is still work that's needed. So what are the potential implications of my thesis? Why is this so important? Why did I really pursue um, this, this, uh, these research objectives, these research questions? Well, I was, again, really concerned with what um, with Santa Clara County Oak Woodlands and also the Lepidoptera or the butterfly and larval communities because these are the foundation of, um, of ecosystems in Santa Clara County. Um, they're not the, the only species that are the foundation, but they are very key to the health and to the, um, the survival of multiple trophic levels, to apex predators, to avian species, and to even lower um, trophic levels like fungi. So all the role of oaks and Lepidoptera need to be uh, fully understood. They need to be fully um, managed in order to make sure that climate change does not uh, worsen their functionality. So within Santa Clara County, if we were to get a little more spe specific, Nymphalidae lepid lepidoptera like uh, Adelphi californica, and then there's also Aranus uh, perpetuus. Um, they all uh, play sig significant roles in oak woodlands composition. The study areas, uh, the study area that I chose, Santa Clara County, and specifically Mount Hamilton Range, have elevational uh, characteristics and ecological characteristics that again lend itself to um, an elevational study where I can test multiple theoretical frameworks. The results of the study are intended to, again, speak to climate adaptation and better um, strategies of biodiversity conservation uh, specific to the oak woodlands found here in Central America. So, if we were to look back, look closer at uh, climate impacts we would see that there are already models and forecasts that exist. There are already impacts that are forecasted for multi-trophic responses, what I already introduced in the, in the um, previous slides. And there are also um, forecasts that ecosystems at a, again, organismal, at population and community level will be impacted. Because trophic levels are so interconnected, the mortality rates, the uh, mm -hmm. phenological desynchronization, all these different uh, phenomena might worsen with climate trends. So the figure on the right shows expected multi-trophic responses to climate change within terrestrial ecosystems, and that pertains, of course, to either oak woodlands or to other ones that you may find in California. The, the solid arrows show the direct effects, and then the, the um, dashed arrows show the altered relationships between um, both the both uh, either plants and uh, herbivores, or plants and predators, and also uh, predators and herbivores. So the, again, the dashed lines all show the altered um, interactions that may may occur from climate change, and then the the solid lines point to the direct effects. The most important uh, aspect, I think, of of this figure is the bottom portion, which is the this list the categories of indirect effects that will happen across all trophic levels. This is what we really need to pay attention to because of the, of the, um, the scale of impact for trophic levels. So for instance, um, you might find, uh, past research has found that limited distribution, phenological desynchronization, incomplete life cycles, and increased mortality, rate, mortality rates for both vegetation and insects have occurred in various um, studies, and that's in Asia and Mediterranean re regions. These trends have shown that uh, we really need to pay attention to, to not just one species, but again, multiple levels of, um, of the trophic system. So this, with limited uh, distribution, I'll share some examples for each of the, these categories listed. With limited um, tr distribution, several uh, plant herbivore studies show that climate, climate extremes or novel low temperatures uh, actually limited lepidopteran distribution. Again, I emphasize lepidoptera because they are sensitive to climate change and they are a key um, insect herbivore for, for um, host plants, including 
um, higher levels of vegetation. Another sh study show uh, that Lepidoptera, such as Pieris brassicae, uh, dispersed, were able to disperse to new habitats, but then once they, once they did um, disperse to new habitats, they did shift in their demographic range and with these novel temperature increases. So as they shifted, they, they found new plants to actually feed on. Now the, the plants within themselves were unable to counter those attacks and were severely defoliated and, and it increased their unseasonable mortalities, mortality rates. So there you see that not only limited distribution happens, but there's a mismatch or there's a trophic mismatch or a reshuffling of plant and animal communities. This leads us to the second phenomenon where you see phenological desynchronization or when uh, plant and plants and animals are out of phase with other ecological, um, ecological uh, biotic or abiotic factors. So plant and insect phenology are cued by uh, photo periods, by temperature, and also by climate. So this means like the emergence of a bud or emergence of larvae is cued or happens once the right conditions happen. So the right photo period, the right sun exposure, the right, um, the right temperature is surrounded by that organism. Now with climate change, it will affect um, all of those three major um, types of, of cues. So studies have shown that with the increase of temperatures, that actually upsets or disrupts the natural um, phenological patterns that both Lepidoptera and the host plants um, have. So there might be early herbivore upsurges that a host plant is not ready for, again, um, and they get defoliated, or they, um, they have, there's a high rate of vegetation mortality because the plants are unable to um, counter such an herbivore attack. So in terms of um, incomplete life cycles, again, with climate change, with extreme um, temperatures, or with new uh, temperature rises, average temperature rises, the there are increased um, life cycle, inc incomplete life cycles within Lepidoptera communities, and this in turn has actually be been connected to a de decrease in plant diversity. So unfortunately, it's a, a twofold um, consequence. So we have, um, we have to understand what that means for us. I mean, the, this model speaks to um, many general um, outlooks of, sorry, this is not working, to, um, it's a general outlook, outlook for terrestrial communities. But what does that mean for Santa Clara County? What does it mean for our oak woodlands that support 5,000 insect species, for 370 species of fungi, all these different trophic levels? What does it mean for the 300 species of um, vertebrate, ter terrestrial vertebrates? So in, ac in actuality, or in, in, observed, um, in observed trends with studies in California and other um, surrounding area areas, sorry, extreme ther thermal changes and aver average temperature increases have actually shown to degrade the fun ecological, the key ecological functions of oak woodlands. And that, inc that includes the critical habitat value, as well as the soil st stabilization, the lit lit litter uh, decomposition, and the um, biomass production that all of the um, different uh, animal groups that I did uh, the faunal and floristic groups that have been mentioned, they all depend on those ecological functions. So once you disrupt or degrade um, those ecological functions, in turn, of course, you will disrupt the survival and mortality rates of um, insect communities, native fauna and, and uh, understory uh, flora. So our, our, or my, my um, main search was to see what types of tools can uh, can slow down or um, adapt to this forecast. So, when we when we think of all of the different types of theoretical frameworks that have been used to understand and estimate the impact of climate climate in insect or herbivore relationships, again, I was drawn to the resource availability hypothesis. As I said before, the, um, I was also drawn to the 
plant size apparent, uh, apparency hypothesis. As I said before, the main influence that the resource availability hypothesis predicts is the elevate is that elevation, temperature, and climate uh, and precipitation create climate stressors and also influence the herbivore pressure assembly, the defensive chemistry. That means the the foliar um, defenses, the chemistry within the plant that can attract or deter insect herbivores. This also includes physical traits that they might have, strategies that they might have to deter or attract uh, insect herbivores. With the plant size apparent apparency hypothesis, um, again it was size that's the main driver and uh, specifically this size can dictate the visual attractiveness, the chemical um, attra uh, attractiveness or conspicuousness of the, of the organism. It can also make it more uh, palatable and it can make it um, actually shift the chem chemical defense levels. So in the next slides I'll just go into that. I'll describe more of each of these theoretical frameworks that have been used to estimate climate impact. So with resource availability hypothesis, we have um, certain assumptions. Assumptions that go by elevation. At higher elevations, um, the, the hypothesis posits that, that we have uh, leaf morphology traits, we have cooler temperatures here, harsher conditions, and lower, um, lower insect delivery because it's less hospitable for insects. So with this vegetation, the vegetation's res response to lower, um, lower rates of herbivory, it would grow slower. It would also um, have lower um, chemical defenses. It would invest in less um, chem plant chemicals in order to um, survive. It would, th even though that may happen, it also heightens its physical traits. So um, the physical resistance traits, such as uh, thickening the leaf cuticle or actually um, making sure that they, they're less palatable or have less nutrition for, for the insects that, that um, do feed on them, um, they would heighten those strategies instead of, um, instead of investing in chemical defenses. At lower elevations, you would find perhaps the, the inverse. So there would be more, um, more uh, there would be warmer temperatures, there would be higher insect herbivory, would, again, more favorable conditions for insect herbivores, and the vegetation would respond accordingly. So there would be higher chemical defenses, and we would have um, a faster growth to counter any of the herbivory that is happening. So, um, and then again, there would be less investment in physical traits or less morphological uh, strategies that would be uh, used by the plant. In terms of plant size apparency hypothesis, you have uh, larger, more, it is assumed that larger apparent uh, plants would actually dictate more visibility, we would have higher palatability, and then we would also have uh, higher dispersal rates. So the investment in higher visibility or higher growth and also making sure that their physical traits make them more palatable are, are not always, are not negative. They actually cause the plant to be, to have greater dispersal rates and there's observed um, higher resource